And there we go. Still got a little lip. A little bit. Well, good morning, church family. Good morning, Marcus. To uh, my faithful few. <laughs> oh, you guys are going to have to carry the discussion today. So, but well, praise the Lord. We're two or three of guys, right? Uh, so we're going to end our series today on the lessons of the minor prophets. Uh, we're going to be talking about Malachi. Now, uh, you probably will notice that I, I skipped over Zechariah. Well, uh, there's a reason for that, because Zechariah is uh, so much, so much of Zechariah has to do with end time prophecy, but I actually don't put that in the same category as the minor prophets. So that's just me. That's just me. That's just my opinion. No letters, please, or, or comments. Uh, that's just my opinion. Uh, I, I put Zechariah more in the same uh, category as Isaiah and Ezekiel and, and those and Daniel, those books that deal with end time prophecy, even though it is uh, a relatively short book. So we're, we're not going to deal with Zechariah right now. I think there, I think I will do a study or a series on end times. Uh, I'm still kind of working out how that would work. Because so much of end time prophecy is is obscure, uh, you know. I mean, I know what the general consensus is on what some of these things mean. Uh, I don't happen to agree a lot with the general consensus. Yeah, shocker, right? Um, but uh, we'll we'll talk about that. I think the fall would be the time to do that uh, to deal with end times prophecy, especially around the election. Anyway. <laughs> I'm kidding, okay? I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, uh, more to come on that, but uh, we'll we'll finish our series today on the uh, on the book of Ma or with the book of Malachi. Now, Malachi is the last of the uh, of the Old Testament prophets. He is the last one to prophesy before the 400 years of silence uh, that we that we encounter between the Old Testament and the New Testament. So, and, and this is about a hundred years after the first exiles returned. So Haggai was the prophet that, that preached to those first exiles. Uh, Malachi is preaching here about a hundred years later. There have been, I think, uh, three sets, three or four sets of exiles that have returned to Jerusalem. The temple has been rebuilt at this time. The, the wall around Jerusalem has been rebuilt. Uh, you, you can read about that. In uh, Nehemiah, Nehemiah, his his heart's desire was to rebuild the wall in Jerusalem to to restore the pride of uh, of the Jews. Uh, but all of that has already taken place. The Jews are now uh, back in their homeland. They are they are established and they are living in relative peace. Uh, they've never been popular, uh, you know, uh, but you know they are living in relative peace at this time. Persia is still the superpower at this time. Uh, so they are still living under uh, the rule of the Persian Empire. But uh, but they are living in, in some in some measure of peace. And uh, Malachi has four chapters and 55 verses and Malachi is, is, is unique. It is absolutely unique among the among the uh, minor prophets because it takes the form of a debate or or a courtroom proceeding. See, where Malachi, on God's behalf, he makes an assertion or a charge against Israel. And then after the charge is made, a, an objection is raised. The, the Israelite, and, and speaking as though the Israelites would be speaking, they, they ask how, or why, or what have we done? And then, uh, you know, God brings evidence uh, to back up the charge, to show that, that you know, this is true. So it, it is very unique in that regard. It, it is more it is more like a, a, a legal proceeding than all the other prophets. Um, so uh, and we're going to go through that now. Eight I counted eight times the one of the things I was studying said there were ten of these in, in the Bible or in Malachi. I only found eight, so I'm just going to deal with the eight that I found and we'll go from there because I don't think it, it changes. It doesn't change the lessons. Of the book of Malachi, uh, whatever two I may have missed, I apologize. But 
you know, I found eight. All right, and we're going to deal with those eight. So the first one is found in Malachi 1, verse 2. It says, I have loved you, says the Lord, but you ask, how have you loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother? Declares the Lord, yet I have loved Jacob. So the Lord is telling him, I, you know, he is uh, making the charge to the Israelites that I, I've loved you. So the, the connotation here is that the Israelites have not loved God. So he says, I have loved you. And then the question is posed, well, how have you loved us? And God is saying, there were two, there were two kids, wasn't there? There was Esau and Jacob, and I chose Jacob. So that's, that's number one. All right, the second one is in uh, Malachi 1, verses 6 and 7. A son honors his father and a slave his master. If I am a father, where is the honor due me? If I am a master, where is the respect due me, says the Lord Almighty? It is you priests who show contempt for my name. But you ask, how have we shown contempt for your name? By offering defiled food on my altar. So we know uh, from back in the law, uh, the, the Lord commanded that sacrifices be made on the altar. This, this goes back all the way to Adam and Eve. The, the way to atone for our sins was an animal sacrifice. And God said that the animal needed to be without spot or blemish. And this was a, a, a vision of the coming Messiah who would sacrifice. He would be without spot or blemish and he would make the final sacrifice for our sins. But in this time, uh, the priests and the, and the Israelites are bringing offerings of lame animals and blind animals and just animals that nobody would want, right? So basically, they're bringing God the leftovers. Instead of bringing God the first fruits, which is what he commanded, they are bringing him the leftovers. Does that sound familiar? Just ask. Anyway, <laughs> the next one, number three, is Malachi 1, 7 and 8. Uh, but you ask, how have we defiled you? By saying that the Lord's temple is contemptible. When you offer blind animals or sacrifice, or for sacrifice, is that not wrong? When you sacrifice lame or diseased animals, is that not wrong? Try offering them to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you, said the Lord Almighty? And I love that, that comparison. Because it, it, it is so true. I mean, we, we bring offerings, we bring the leftovers to God. But would you dare to bring the leftovers to the President of the United States? Or to the Governor of the State of Pennsylvania? Or even to your boss? Right? Let's drill it all the way down. Would you dare bring the leftover to your boss? Uh, yeah, probably not, because then you probably wouldn't have a job for very long, right? So God is, you know, God is right when he says this. He's like, yeah, try bringing those offerings to your governor and see what he says. And again, the connotation here is, as God said, you know, if I'm a father, if I'm a master, where's the respect due to me? You respect the governor more than you do me. All right, so number four, Malachi 2, 13 through 16. Another thing you do, you flood the Lord's altar with tears. You weep and wail because he no longer looks with favor on your offerings or accepts them with pleasure from your hands. But you ask why? It is because the Lord is a witness between you and the wife of your youth. You have been unfaithful to her, though she is your partner, the wife of your marriage covenant. Has not the one God made you? You belong to him in body and spirit. And what does the one God seek? Godly offspring. So be on your guard and do not be unfaithful to the wife of your youth. The man who hates and divorces his wife, says the Lord, the God of Israel, does violence to the one he should protect, says the Lord Almighty. There's, there's, a, there's a, a can of worms, isn't it? Uh, as we in the church, and I don't mean this church specifically, I'm just talking about the church in general, we, we kind of normalize divorce in the church. And we just kind of pass over it as if it's not a big deal. And, and God here, I mean, this is strong language, guys. The one who hates and divorces his wife does violence to the one he should protect. That is pretty strong language. And, and it should tell us very clearly what God thinks of divorce. And, and look, I know you might say, well, that's Old Testament. Well, Jesus reiterated this same sentiment when asked about divorce directly. Right? We, can, we can point to that very easily when Jesus said that, you know, if, if you divorce your wife, you cause her to commit adultery. And, and anyone who marries a divorced woman, you know, commits adultery. So I, I think it's very clear here what God thinks of divorce. But like, you know, the 20th century America and 21st century America, 
you know, the Israelites had gotten comfortable with divorce. And, and God is saying, that's, you know, that's not right. You're not, I don't want you getting comfortable with that idea. All right, so number five, Malachi 2.17 says, You have wearied the Lord with your words. How have we wearied him, you ask? By saying, all who do evil are good in the eyes of the Lord, and he is pleased with them. Or where is the God of justice? Now, this is interesting because it, it brings to mind a lot of, of the thinking that we have today, right? It's like, well, where is God? That's, that's a question a lot. I hear a lot of people ask, unbelievers. I hear a lot of people ask. It's like, well, where is God with all the wars going on in the world, with all the, 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 the difficulties we're having in this country? They are always asking, where is God? And, and look, God is saying, you know, God is saying, you know, I'm getting tired of you people complaining. Basically. And and the right immediately after this, okay, immediately after this, it is a there is a prophecy of the Messiah. And the Lord is saying, look, not only am I a God of justice, but I'm gonna send one. I'm gonna send my Messiah, and he is going to come, he is going to establish justice on the earth. He's gonna show you what is just. And God is saying, I haven't forgotten justice. I may be merciful, but I haven't forgotten. Uh, justice in the world. All right. Number, number five. Number six. Malachi 3, 6 through 8 says, I, the Lord, do not change. So you, the descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Ever since the time of your ancestors, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord. Oh, my God. But you ask, how are we to return? Will a mere mortal rob God, yet you rob me? And number seven is another question. Uh, verses eight and nine says, But you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings. You, you are under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. Now look, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on that. I don't like talking about money. But I think the implication here is clear. Our tithes belong to God, period. The, the first fruits, again, this goes back to the idea of first fruits. The first 10% of your income belongs to God. Now, I, I, I recently saw somebody on Facebook uh, post uh, a, a message by a preacher who said that uh, tithing was an Old Testament concept, right? And that the New Testament doesn't speak about tithing. Uh, first of all, that's wrong. And, and I made it clear in, in my response to this person's post. This person is a, a friend of mine from, uh, from way back when. <laughs> and, and I was comfortable telling them they were wrong. Uh, because uh, what Jesus said to uh, to the Pharisees, and I don't remember the chapter and verse right now, I should have written it down. Uh, but Jesus said uh, to the Pharisees, "Is that you 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 tithe of everything that you have, but you forgot the weightier matters of the law, mercy, love, and justice." He said, "You should have practiced the the latter without neglecting the former." So he mentioned tithe, and he mentioned justice, love, and mercy, and he said, "You should be practicing both of those things." So the New Testament does talk about tithe, and no less than Jesus Christ said that we should be practicing tithing. So the idea that, there, that tithing is an Old Testament concept is debunked right then and there. So tithing is a New Testament concept uh, because Jesus may have been taking us away from the single temple, but he was creating a church. Jesus was creating a church, and he knew there'd be churches all over the world. Look, and those churches need support. Uh, you know, if you if you want to have a church to come to, you, you know, this building it costs money to maintain this building. It costs the electricity costs money, the water costs money. Uh, you know, I'm part time, but I, I still get a part time salary for the work that I put in uh, in the church. So all of those things require uh, support, and that's what the tithe is for. Tithe belongs to the local church. And that is different from offerings. You are free to give your offerings wherever you want. You can give it to your local church. You can give it to any ministry or, or, or charity that you choose. But your tithe belongs to the church. All right, that's enough of that. Number seven. I'm sorry, I, I said eight. Does that actually? Yeah, no, there's eight. Okay, so this is seven. Uh, Malachi, and that was what, how are we robbing? Okay, so that was seven. I got it, I got it, come back. Uh, now, number eight, the last one, Malachi 3, 13 and 14. You have spoken arrogantly against me, says the Lord. 
Yet you ask, what have we said against you? You have said, it is futile to serve God. What do we gain by carrying on in requirements and going about like more with the Lord Almighty? And, and look, again, this is another sentiment I've, heard, I've, I've uh, heard before. Uh, again, mostly from unbelievers. Uh, but I have, I have heard one or two believers say this. It's like, well, what is the point of serving God? If, if I'm going to suffer anyway, if I'm going to have to deal with all these, these negative circumstances, then what is the point of serving God? It, it goes to a fundamental misunderstanding of what it is to serve God. If we think that because we serve God, that our life should be easy. And, and we still have that, that mindset, right? Even in the, in, in the back of our minds, that, that, that nagging little voice in the back of our minds is, is the devil's telling us, well, you serve the Lord. Shouldn't things be easy for you? It's like, no, Jesus never told us that. As a matter of fact, Jesus told us we would encounter affliction. Je you know, uh, being, being a Christian isn't about having an easy life. It's about showing the world how to overcome the issues and the problems that they face. And, and showing the world that it is possible to live with peace, even in the midst of affliction. I mean, who are you more likely to, to listen to when you're going through a hard time? The person who's never had anything difficult? Or the person who's had a hard time and, and you know that they've gotten through it? Who are you more likely to talk to about that? You know, I, I for me, I'm more likely to talk to the person who I know has been through the ringer like I and, and gotten on the other side. Because I want to know, how did you get through this? How did you get to the other side? So, and, and this is why there have been some pastors that I would not, uh, that I would not uh, confide, because they just did not appear to know uh, what I was going through, or to understand what I was going through. Now, maybe they did, but they, they, they gave that appearance of, of never having any issues, and, and you know, maybe it kind of it goes back to, to the book of Job, right? His friends immediately, when Job goes through difficulty, his friends immediately think, well, you must have sinned. And he must have done something really bad for God to strike you like that. And, and if, the, if the book of Job teaches us nothing else, it's that it's you can go through hard times and, and, and even though you're a righteous person. Because God himself testified that Job was righteous. And, and I believe God. Okay? <laughs> I don't think God's going to lie about that or exactly. God said he is blameless. And so it is possible to be spiritually blameless and yet go through different. And, and there are, I've, I've encountered pastors who, who don't believe that, who believe that, well, you must have sinned, and there must be something in your life that God is trying to weed out. No, that's not necessarily true. And people who have been through difficult circumstances probably would understand that. Okay. So, and then uh, Malachi also ends in chapter 4, a uh, very small chapter in chapter 4. It ends with the prophecy on the coming of Elijah who would precede the Messiah. All right, so that's the overview, right? All right, so here's where I stop talking and I ask you the question, right? What do you think, taking all of that together, what do you think is the, the primary lesson of the book of, of Malachi? First thing that comes to your head. We have to check ourselves. Excellent. We, we have to check ourselves, you know, all those questions like, well, how did we do this thing? How did we do that thing? Like, you know, we, they, they're thinking more highly of themselves than they are. That's good. That's good. Very close. Very close. Anybody else? Being obedient. Mm -hmm. Being obedient is very important. That is part of what the uh, what the lesson is. Yes. Anybody else want to take a stab at it? No. Don't be afraid. We're all friends here. <laughs> well, the entire book of Malachi can be summed up in one thing. We need to remember who God is. We need to remember who God is. And this goes to what you were saying, Leah. You need to check yourself and, and realize that, you, that we serve an absolutely holy God. And, and, this, is, and this is where... Uh, where people get confused because we do live in an era of grace, right? The cross of Jesus Christ, the, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ has bestowed grace upon us. But some of us take that grace to, to mean that, you know, I don't have to 
take God seriously. I'm under grace. And if I mess up, then, oh, God will just forgive me. And I've heard that, I don't know how many times. It's like, oh, if I mess up, oh, God will forgive me. It's okay. No, it's not okay. And the book of Malachi tells us that it is that we need to be taking God seriously. And now the Israelites, with the Israelites, it was about their offerings. It was about uh, offering the leftovers. It was about not giving the first fruits, not giving the tithe, about you know letting divorce become commonplace, and 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 really thinking in their hearts, well, you know, we serve the Persian Empire and we're doing pretty well. Why? What, what's the point of serving God? Right. This is what the Israelites were dealing with. There are parallels to everything that we face now in this world. Right. We 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 are called by God to seek first. The kingdom of God and his righteousness. And we love to quote that, right? We love to quote that. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these other things are added to you. But if I were to check your schedule, and I were to look at your checkbook, would I see that you are seeking the kingdom of God first? Or are you seeking all these other things and then giving God the leftovers? So we need to understand that we serve the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We need to come back to an understanding of how awesome God really is. And, and going, uh, going to what Bob said about obedience, the commandments of God are just that. They are commandments. They are not suggestions. They are not simply good rules to live by. They are commandments, and obedience is not optional. And that's the thing, you know, when we're living, when you're living under grace, and and the wrath of God is delayed, you got you. We have a tendency, as the Israelites did, to believe that God doesn't care. God doesn't care what we get. God doesn't care how we live. God doesn't care if I cheat on my wife. God doesn't care if I, you know, hold back my time. No, He does care because these are commandments. These are the things that God has told you are required of you in order to come into the presence of a holy God. And we, we don't understand that concept. You don't understand what it means to be holy. Of course we don't, because we can't be holy. Without Jesus Christ, there is no holiness within us. But holiness basically means set apart. It means other. God is so completely different from anything you, you, you think about. Just take him out of the box that you place him in, because he don't fit in that box. He is so much bigger, so much more awesome, so much more above anything that you that you have ever thought about God. At your at your best, in your most humble and and worshipful moment, God is a billion times higher than that God that you. And, and look, we, it's, I, I understand that it's hard for us to really grasp that concept. But, but like Juanita said, we need to check ourselves sometimes. And understand that, that you know, we, we got to stop puffing out our chest and thinking, oh, I'm fine. God loves me. Yeah, he does love you. But there are requirements. I love my kids. But when they were disobedient, guess what? They suffered the consequences. As much as I loved them and I hated punishing them, I had to do it because you know that's my job as a father, as a good father, a good a good father, a good parent disciplines their children because it keeps them from the future pain that they would feel if you don't discipline them. Questions, comments, anything? There's only a few of us guys. So. <laughs> All right, Hebrews 10, 26 to 31. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and a raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot? who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified them, and, had, and who has insulted the spirit of grace. 
For we know him who said, It is mine to avenge, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Whew. I get goosebumps whenever I read that. Man. Seriously. That's not the same ooey gooey God that we that we're used to listen to, to hearing about, is it? No, no, this is this is the God of, of the you know the creator of the universe. This is the judge of all mankind that we're talking about here. We're talking about, you know, the, the most high, El Elyon, God most high. And That's why it pays to be innocent and truthful to the Lord. Because he's the one that does all the things for you. That's right. And without it, you're lost. That's right. And, and that's the thing we don't understand. That's the thing we don't grasp. You know, Jesus told his disciples, without me, you can do nothing. Like, you can't do anything without Jesus. I mean, the, it, you know, later on in the Bible, it says that God, it is God that works within us to will and to act. Even the will to do good, even the desire to do good has to come from God. Like, I can't even desire what is good without Jesus Christ. So, you know, when I wake up in the morning and I and I and I go to pray and I and I read his word and I'm and I'm thinking I wanna I wanna you know do something for the Lord today, all that comes from God. None of that comes from me. When I stand before God, I have got nothing to be proud of. Because everything, everything good about me, everything good that I do or say or think actually comes from God. Amen. So when I stand, when I stand before God, I probably won't be standing. I'll be on my face before God. Just in complete gratitude. And that's where we're all going to be. Anybody else? Hebrews 12, 28 and 29. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Worship. That is the proper way to approach God. And worship requires humility. You don't worship the thing that you look down on. You only worship the thing that you look up to. And too many of us are worshiping our chosen political candidates. You know who you are. <laughs> too many of us are worshiping people. And this is why so many people fall away when leaders fall. Look, uh, a pastor, a, a ministry leader is still just a human being. And they are as subject to temptation as anybody else. There is nothing about me, there's nothing more holy about me than you. There is nothing about me that, that makes me more, uh, more apt to serve God than you. I struggle the same way that you guys struggle. I am here simply by the grace of God because God chose me, period. By his own grace, for his own purposes, there's nothing about me that, that makes me worthy of that choice. As a matter of fact, the fact that I am unworthy is why God chose me in the first place. Because the Bible says that God chose the, the, the foolish things of the world to confound the things that are wise. And he chose the weak things to confound the things that are strong. So that none of us have any reason to boast before him. I have no reason to boast as a pastor because nothing, nothing about me makes me qualified to be a pastor. As a matter of fact, there's so much in my life that, that disqualifies. But God's grace allows me to be here. My response to that, and that's what we're talking about here, our response to that kind of grace, our response to that kind of love, should be humble obedience. Amen. That's why I thank God this morning when I woke up. And I need to thank you, Lord, that I had a good night's sleep. What can I do to please you today? And I was sitting, and... Normally, the first thing I do is take my pills in the morning. And I thank God this morning. I say, you know, God, I never thank you for allowing me to take these pills because it's making my insides a lot better. So thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Yeah. And, and that's a perfect example of humility. Yeah. Because a lot of us, in, in the face of that, would be like, well, why do I have to take all these pills? 
You know, if God loves me, why can't I just, you know, not have to take these pills? That's what's keeping me alive. There you go. <laughs> you know what? That's the attitude we should have. That God gave doctors wisdom. God gave the researchers wisdom to 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 come up with these medications that that actually help us as we get older. Because look, the fact of the matter is, our our bodies decay over time. You know, I mean, you you reach your peak probably in your thirties. And then it's all downhill from there, right? <laughs> Those of us who are, you know, on the other side of 40 can relate to that, right? Everybody, you know, it's funny because all my all my friends who were over 40, when I was when I was about to hit 40, all my friends were telling me who were over 40, they're like, oh, just wait. You're gonna hit 40 and it's all gonna go downhill from there. It's you know, and the funny thing is, and this is this is how I know God has a sense of humor, right? The, my 40th year, the year I met turned 40 was my, the best year of my life. Okay? Uh, one, well, I'll say one of the best years, but it was very close to being the absolute best year of my life. I turned 41, and like everything went downhill right there, okay? I was like, I'm like, you know what? That's not funny, God. Really, you know? It's like, I, I always tell my wife, it's like, God has a sense of humor, and I must be his favorite joke because, you know, he's always doing stuff like we don't you know, realize hey, how good we really have. That's time. right. That's right. Hey, being court jester to the king, you know, ain't so bad, right? There are worse things. So, you know, as a matter of fact, the court jester usually gains a lot of honor because he makes the king laugh. Right? So, um, you know, that's that's my too, right? It's like, all right, Lord, you got a good laugh out of me? Okay, that's fine. So, praise be to God. And I'll tell you another story about that after after I turn the camera off. I actually have a prayer request that uh, I can't speak on camera, uh, not yet. Uh, so, but I'll tell you a little story about how God loves to laugh at me. So, uh, anyway, so we're talking about coming to God in humility, and I've got two examples here of what happens when we actually come face to face with God. Right? One is in Isaiah. 6, 1 through 5, it says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, high and lifted up, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. That was Isaiah's uh, response when he saw the Lord. Luke 5, 1 through 8. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen, who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. I mean, I, I can't I can't explain it any better than that. When you come face to face with the Lord Almighty. Now look, these are people chosen by God. Isaiah and Peter, these were these were leaders. These were people specifically chosen by God. And when God showed up, their response was, I can't even be in your presence. I don't even deserve to be in your presence, God. And that is the response. That is the, that is the entire gist of Malachi. Malachi is telling Israel, you have, you have lost the awe of God. And, and we need to gain that back. And I think the same could be said for churches here in America. We have lost the, the, the reality of how awesome God is and how unworthy we really are 
Again, we are talking about Isaiah, who, who was a prophet already <clears throat> when King Uzziah died. He was already being used by God. We are talking about Simon Peter, who was already called by Jesus at that time. He said, come, and I will make you fishers of men. These were chosen men of God. And when God showed up, and this is Jesus in human form. I mean, Isaiah saw God. I mean, he saw God high and lifted up, sitting on his throne. Uh, Peter saw Jesus, the human Jesus standing before him, and got that glimpse of him in that moment. And threw himself down at Jesus' knees and said, I can't even be in your presence, God. I, I just go away from you. I'm, I'm a sinful person. That's the response, guys. That's the response that we that we that, that God deserves. That is the response. And and forget what God deserves. That is the response that we will have when we come face to face with God. Some of us look, I know that I'm going to be at the right side of God. I know I will hear, well done, good and faithful servant. And and I will get to spend eternity with God. But you know what's going to happen when I stand before God? After all of my life of service, after everything that I've done for God, I'm going to fall at God's feet. And I'm going to be weeping at how, how unworthy I am to even be standing there in that moment. Because that's what, that's what the response is every time people come face to face with God. We recognize just how dirty and how unworthy we are. You know what the Bible tells us? That our righteousness... Our righteousness is like filthy rags to God. You at your best, on your best day, you God looks at you and, and sees filthy rags. That's the difference between us and God. And you know what? You know what the you know what the good news is in that, you know, as as I transition here, because I, I, I do want you to get. A, a, a proper vision of God. I want you to understand just how unworthy we are even to be in his presence. Even for him to consider us for one millisecond, we are unworthy. But do you know what, what makes that so awesome? He considers you anyway. He died for you anyway. He loved you anyway. We are so unworthy. We are so dirty. Our righteousness is like filthy rags before God. And yet, he loves us. He loves us anyway. And he demonstrated that love through Jesus Christ. Dying on the cross for our sins. All of that, all of that should evoke humility in every one of us. We, sh we cannot come to God in pride, puffing on our chest. And, and too many, too many Christians come to God that way. Too many Christians come to God with that puffed out chest and say, I am a child of God. Too many churches actually pat people on the back for that attitude. No, our proper response to God is, is, is just abject humility and gratefulness to God. Because we are dust. Dust. That's what we are. Do you know what you are? Uh, I think the calculation is the chemicals that make up your body come up to, a, to, to like $9. I think that's what it is now. I don't, I don't know that for sure. Don't, don't quote me on that. But it's some ridiculously low number. If you were to take all the chemicals that make up your body right now, you would be worth about 9 bucks. That's what you are. When we die, that's what we turn into. We are nine dollars of chemical chemicals and, and like 85% water. We are bags of water, people. That's it. How dare we? How dare we even think of coming to God with anything but humility? He took nine dollars worth of chemicals, added a little water, and breathed into us. And here we are. And that's the pinnacle of creation, guys. <laughs> this is how awesome God is. The pinnacle of creation is nine bucks worth of chemicals and a bunch of water. 
That was a pinnacle of creation. But we're all unique too. That's right. And exactly every one of us absolutely unique. That is the awesomeness of God, guys. He could take nine dollars worth of chemicals, add some water, and create seven billion unique individuals, and even more as you go back in time. He can create billions upon billions of unique personalities and individuals. I mean, what what do you have compared to that, guys? What have you got to come to God compared to that? I got nothing. All right. I came to that realization many, many years ago. I got nothing. And I come to God every morning with that same, with that same attitude. It's like, Lord, I got nothing for you. Well, that tells you just how good God is. That's right. Because with all those in, infallibly goofy things we do do, God loves us no matter what. That's right. And that's the good news. Yeah. And when you ask God, like I've asked him so many times, he said, it's because I love you. That's right. It's because I need you to be with me. And I keep saying to myself, what in heaven's name would he want to do with me? That's right. Such a <laughs> exactly. man. I'm, not, I'm nothing. That's right. And he says to me, it's because I love you. That's why you have to come home. That's right. And and that's the good news. That is the, the, the flip side of this coin. You know what? Let me tell you something. I've, I've been so terrible in my life. There were days my mother didn't want to be around me. Okay. My own mother didn't want to be around me, but you know what? As Bob just said, God wants to be around us. And that's the awesome thing. As awesome as God is, as unworthy as we are, God still considered us. This is the same thing with the Israelites. As unworthy as they were, as much as they disrespected God, he still sent Malachi to them. And he reminded them, I'm going to send you on Messiah. He reminded them through Malachi again. I am going to send the Messiah to you. It's like, even though you've disrespected me, even though you don't love me, even though you, you, you disobey my commandments, I'm still calling to you. I'm still coming after you. I am still pursuing you. And I am going to send you a Messiah to redeem you. And he that's will, the lesson. He will still put his arms around you and hug you. That's right. And tell you how much he loves you. That's right. So that's, that's the other side of that coin. Yes, we have to come to God and realize how unworthy we are, but that's what makes the love of God so amazing. That he actually does love us. He actually considered us and died for us. So that's actually good news, guys. It's good news when we realize how unworthy we are because then we can realize how awesome we are. See, it's hard to realize how awesome the love of God is if you're coming all puffed up and you think, yeah, that's right, God loves me. Of course he does. Look how wonderful I am. Right? I mean, we've all been in relationships like that, I'm sure. I know I have, okay? I was an egomaniac growing up. All right? And, I, you know, I always thought it was a privilege for the girls who went out with me. Right? <laughs> Stop laughing. I that one. But that's how that's how far my pride went, right? And look, don't don't, be, don't don't act like you haven't felt like that too at one time or another, okay? We've all felt that way. Yeah, it's like, oh, you're you're just lucky to be with me, right? <laughs> you know? But that's you know what? When when you're in a relationship like that, you you can't appreciate the love that person has for you. But when you're in a relationship where you're where you're thinking to yourself, you know what? I'm so lucky that this person's in my life. I, I you know, even even though I made mistakes and, and I hurt this person, they stuck by me. And and they loved me through it. And and they worked with me and, and we, we developed this relationship together. That's when you can look at the person and think, wow, that person actually loves me. And and it's an awesome thing, right? Well, it's the same thing with God, and, and multiply that by you know a trillion, a trillion times a trillion, and, and understand that as unworthy as we are, as, as often as we have as we have hurt God, as as often as we have disobeyed God and disrespected God, yet He still loves us. He still wants to work with us. He still wants to put His arms around us and and lead us in the right way. 
And that's the lesson of the book of Malachi. Anybody else? Questions, comments? All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just come to you in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you for now. We thank you, Lord, because though we are filthy rags, we are dust, Lord Jesus, we are nine dollars of chemicals, Lord. You actually love us. You love us enough to have died for us. What, what do we have compared to that, dear God? We have nothing, Lord, to bring to you except our humble worship, dear God. And so we thank you, Lord, and I pray that we will get that message in our hearts, dear God. That we will get it in our hearts and understand just how awesome your love is for us. We thank you for that, Lord. Bless these people as they go. In Jesus' name, amen. And God bless you, church. I don't know what to do.